Great, Khalid, um, we are kicking off with the question, um, and I'm asking each one of uh, your fellow panelists, what role do you think uh, Arab media plays in the region today? And so um, I'd like to pose that question to you to get your thoughts. Yes. What what influence and impact do you think it has currently in the region? Censorship? Well, that's depressing, but it's so nice to be here. Thanks, Mary and Hiba, for uh, organizing uh, this to be among colleagues uh, and to get a break from Washington from reporting on Ben Carson's uh, childhood <laughs> and how peaceful is the Middle East. Um, so, you know, talking about Arab media, Nicole, and I think you've experienced this growing up in Lebanon. In the 80s, I remember in our household, we had three official TV channels. Syrian, which was always playing the Ba'ath uh, national anthem. Uh, the Lebanese television, which mostly uh, played soccer games when they were happening, because we, were, we had a civil war too. And the uh, Cypriot uh, TV, which we actually didn't understand. Uh, so, you know, forward two decades on, I think we've seen a massive uh, growth in Arab media. Uh, we have today over 500 television uh, stations in the Arab world. Uh, I think stereotyping uh, Arab media into uh, one direction or another would be a mistake. Uh, like the US media, uh, like what happened you know, after globalization, uh, it is polarized. Uh, we have issues. It's not very independent, but it is very active. In the last four years since the Arab Spring happened, uh, the digital revolution that we saw, the citizen uh, journalism, having Al Jazeera broadcasting live from Tahrir Square in Egypt helped a lot in bringing these voices uh, to the forefront. Uh, now, I am in print media, so we are, uh, I think Khaled is right, yeah, not many people actually uh, read it. Uh, but the transformation that's happening today is on social media. Uh, having, you know, if you look at the Arab world, it's uh, more than 50% are under the age of 25. They are making uh, change online. They are uh, even in closed uh, societies like Saudi. Uh, many are using uh, Twitter, I mean even Uber, eBay, Periscope, 
to break barriers that was not available to you know our generation before so while we have many problems today i am still optimistic that uh the the better future is ahead of us and uh, a lot is, is is changing in the arab street same question yes. okay yeah, thanks for the invite first um, let me start by paying tribute to my uh, colleague Khalid. I love his cartoons. Uh, Khalid, the link up with you is established late and I arrived late, so you and I are confirming to these people that Jazeera never misses a beat, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the title of your panel is obviously so unwieldy. I, I assume it's precisely because it's so unwieldy. That's, that's the way you, you chose it. Because it's a cat and you, you can skin it in so many different ways, building and burning bridges. Um, you know, generically speaking, I would like to say that we, the media, uh, in my opinion, uh, are part of the solution but also part of the problem. And the events in the Middle East over the last four or five years since the start of the so-called Arab Spring are often a confirmation of that. The polarization that Joyce uh, mentioned had always existed uh, in uh, Arab societies, but it's been so magnified in the last four or five years in various places. I mean, take Egypt, for example. Um, Arabs, you know, for better or for worse, we take our cue from uh, Egypt. Whatever happens there affects us. Uh, all of us, the good and the bad. And if you think about the, the current uh, uh, state of polarization in, in Egyptian society, it, 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 the society has become so fragmented and the media have become so fragmented. Um, Joyce mentioned social media and obviously that's where the fragmentation and the polarization is so apparent in the specific case of Egypt because what we have seen since the advent of uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi's rule, uh, we, haven't seen, uh, uh, we haven't seen a lot of Egyptian television express different views. We've seen a set a number of Egyptian stations uh, uh, speaking the same language. But when you look at social media, obviously that's where it becomes apparent. Let me just uh, circle this back to Al Jazeera, because with Al Jazeera, the, 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 the fragmentation uh, becomes so clear at the Arab level, not just at the Egyptian level. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we went to Canada, and I'm talking about Al Jazeera Arabic here. We went to Canada and we told them we'd like to be able to broadcast into Canada. And they said, okay, let's let us consider it and we'll get back to you. So they considered it, their commission, their broadcast commission, they considered it, they came back to us. They said, okay, we are going to allow you to broadcast into Canada, but we have one condition. And that condition is that there's going to be a delay so that if there's anything that, you know, that is objectionable, um, we can cut it out. Talk of sponsorship, talk of uh, uh, censorship. Uh, censorship. So we said no. You either allow us to broadcast like everybody else or no game. At the time, many of the objections to Al Jazeera in Canada were from some Jewish Canadian groups because to them, Al Jazeera you know, invited anti, sometimes anti-Semitic guests and so on. Okay, we said no, end of story. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went back. We said, let's try again. Um, the, most of the objections that we heard the last time around, they didn't come from uh, Canadian Jewish groups. They came from some Syrian Canadian groups and some, from some Egyptian Canadian groups uh, who think that uh, Jazeera is obviously in the camp of the Muslim Brotherhood in the camp opposing Abdel Fattah Sisi. So it, that gives you a, an insight into the kind of fragmentation that we are now seeing in the, in the, in the region.
Just one larger circle and I'll shut up. <laughs> the larger circle is that it depends what you think you're doing. You know, some of us think that they are building bridges. The perception on the other side is that we are actually burning bridges, burning bridges as in destroying bridges. And if you put that in the context of East and West, um, Joyce mentioned that in Lebanon in the 80s they only had three uh, channels. Now there's a whole plethora of different channels across the Arab region, over 400 uh, channels. And, you know, if you watch those uh, 400 channels, there's obviously some serious stuff, but there's also a lot of psychobabble. And when you say psychobabble, it, it almost, I would venture to say, you're almost saying there's a lot of bridge burning. Um, because what you assume, what I assume we all mean by building bridges is bringing people together so that they speak a common language. Well, to me, as a member of the Jazeera, uh, Arabic in particular, um, I do what I think is good for my audience in the Arab world. Let's say there's war in Lebanon, the way I cover it, or let's say there's war in Gaza, the way I cover it. So to me, I am building bridges because I am presenting uh, the, the war from a different angle. But to an American audience, they may not necessarily see that as building bridges. They may see it as destroying uh, bridges. But, but, but they play the same game too. I mean, uh, just to, you know, because we do get criticized a lot that the Arab media is supporting, uh, quote unquote, some terrorist groups or uh, branding others as freedom fighters. When the Iraq war happened, there was little questioning uh, from the American media uh, about, uh, you know, the, the justification for the war. Uh, U.S. Uh, servicemen who were dying in Iraq were uh, called, you know, fallen heroes. So when the Gulf or others portray and label their fighters dying in Yemen as heroes, I'm not sure why everyone is surprised here. I mean, it, we're coming back to the national uh, narrative, which applies, like, there is Fox News here, and we probably have many Foxes in the uh, Arab world, but it, it's almost the same media crisis that we're, we're facing, and it's just not exclusive to, to Arab media. Well, you know, to your yeah. point and to Abdul Rahim's point, a lot of this is about perception. And what results um, is, you know, a competing narrative. What are your thoughts, Noah, on that? So one of the things that we always observe here is when we use the term Arabic media, we immediately jump to political context. Mm -hmm. This is one of the challenges with saying, does it build or burn bridges? Political content will always, will always divide, will always polarize, and regardless of what position you take, regardless of how neutral you are. Now, what we saw with the explosion of TV channels, that was, that was um, phenomenal. But what you see is a lot of psychobabble, you see a lot of political content, but then you see programs as, uh, as, um, as non-serious as they are. Let's say Arab Voice, uh, the, the Voice, or Arab Idol. Those programs are united. You see people from all across the world speaking yes. the same language, coming together on a common ground. We don't see that content. We don't see that content online. Um, we continue to see more and more uh, media outlets that are covering this, the Syrian conflict. They're covering more wars. You know, we, we talk about war. Um, Khalid, I love his um, his work. Political, right? Yes. There's absolutely a need for that type of political content, but we lack in terms of non-political content. Uh, this is one of the things that we're trying to do at Casa. We don't cover any politics, we don't cover any religion. What we want to do is cover topics that would unite people. <coughs> what we typically say we want to unite Arabs one cat picture at a time. Right? It is silly, but we have a lot of commonalities. We have simple, uh, we lead simple lives. Uh, we don't talk about it. You know, if, if I may just pick up on that, you know, to me, it is not my job in the 
first place, yeah. uh, to try to unite anybody or disunite anybody. My job is to um, depict a particular situation as it seems to me at a given point in time, whether that's a political situation, a cultural situation, a historical situation, whatever, whatever it may be. You know, the, the, for me, the, the problem arises when you start talking about, one, is it your role to unite or disunite? What business model do you have available for you to practice as a journalist? Now, since we're talking about the Arab media and the American media, if you look at most of the uh, Arab media that existed prior to the explosion uh, of satellite channel uh, across the Arab world. Most of it, as Joyce said, was controlled by governments. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'll tell you why I, I, I don't think that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, governments, wherever they may be, you know, whether in a democracy, semi-democracy, or dictatorship, they all have the instinct that they want to control you as a journalist to say the message the way they want it said. But the flip side of the coin is, and I'm talking here about um, current television channels in the Middle East, for example, that are funded by governments. I'm talking about the channel that I, that I work for, uh, Al Jazeera. If, if, you're, if you're funded in that specific case uh, by a government, what the, the flip side of the coin, the positive side of the coin, is that that allows you because you have, the, you have the money at the end of the financial year, you go to the government that funds you and you say, give me the money, they give you the money. That allows you to do the kind of coverage that you're talking about, not just the political coverage, the kind of coverage that unites us if you see your purview as uniting people. You do a lot of cultural stuff, not just about the Arab region in this particular case, about China, about <coughs> Russia, how do these people live, you go to places that Arab viewers had not even heard of uh, before, and you say, "Hey, look, there's another planet out there that you need to be uh, that you need to be aware." So uh, I'm just, you know, for me, it's just a cautionary tale about what we see our purview is and what we see our model is for doing the kind of journalism that we're talking about. Right. I don't think the uh, the elements of the media side. Uh, if you are a news channel, it is your job to cover news. I think the failing is on our society where we don't have enough people that are interested in generating content that is not political, even though we have enough interest in consumption. But, uh, can, I, can I just um, follow up on this? I, I, it's, I have to disagree uh, with Abdul Rahim here on the government uh, question. Uh, I mean, it, it's hard to generalize and say that the government funding equal censorship but you know we grew up in the same culture we practice self-censorship at age two maybe when do we war. start <laughs> and you precisely do that because you're afraid of the government uh, I do think it would be we would be much better off uh, when we have more independent media, more startups, more uh, social media forums that are not tied to one funding uh, or one billionaire or uh, one government. Because the polarization, that's what drives it too. You look at the Egyptian elections. I mean, I happen to be on Twitter more than I should. Uh, but, but the coverage, it's, I felt, you know, who are we going to quote? It, it, it could drive you to become schizophrenic. Sky News was reporting something. Al Arabiya was reporting something else. Al Jazeera had uh, a different angle. Uh, so it's coming at the expense of the story, of the credibility, and of the accuracy. And that's uh, a very dangerous trend. I want to uh, get Khalid's perspective because um, he is a renowned political cartoonist. So, Khalid, what are your thoughts? Khalid, you can draw it instead of saying it. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a problem with 
funding, uh, and that's why I'm broke. Uh, it's, it's, I, you know, every, everybody's, the, the first question that I, I get always is like, oh, because I live in London, then I must be, you know, I must work for all zero, or I must be funded by London, and my views are other views, or whatever. And, uh, I, I have a, you know, my, my, I have a lot of people that follow my cartoons and everything, and, and mostly it's because I'm independent. It's mostly because I try as much as I can. In you know, in, 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 in the way that I can do it is to, to say what this you know what, what the people say and uh, or what, what I what I think of the situation or ask questions of what I think. You know? And then if I get commissioned to do something, then then I get paid for it. But mostly most of my cartoons are free. And because I, I really don't you know, for me it's most importantly to be independent, to to, to, to keep uh, the belief that, that these people believe in me, that I, I am independent, and that I try as much as I can to say what I, what I can without having to belong to a certain political party or to belong to a certain uh, uh, religious uh, view, you know? I, 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 I try to ask questions that everybody can, can, you know, can, can communicate on and can talk about. So and I think that in itself is, is the funding is, is definitely a problem because you see it, you know, like you see it now. You, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at any news from Yemen that we're getting right now, we're getting from Al uh, we're getting from Al Jazeera, and it's basically the same news. You know, we you what, what happened to the to the um, the the, the, the pilgrims that the, the in in, in Hajjaz, you know, this year that. 200, 200 of them died, you know, they really you know, Nobody knows where they are, some people are missing. You never hear of it again. And this is, and this is the problem, because it's all about, oh, now the island is bad. We, we don't want to hear anything about the island, because the island is bad, that's it, we're done. You know, and that, that comes from where that funding of that channel comes from. Now they want to shut down an IAD channel. I'm not a big fan of an IAD channel, but they have the right to exist, you know? I know because, you know, Saudi owns not an uh, Irish house, they want to keep them out, because, you know, it's, it's, it's it really, it really is a problem of integrity. And it's not only in the Arab world, I think it's in the whole world. I mean, Rupert Murdoch owns everything. Now he owns National Geographic, so I can't even believe what animals do right now. Well, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, really, it's really a problem. It really, it really is. I mean, the only escape that we had, that I had personally, because I don't work for any newspaper, I, I, I work for anyone, um, is social media. That's, that's all we have, and that's still all we have right now. Before the Arab Spring, after the Arab Spring, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. All we have is social media. It is still censored. We're still watched. But, you know, there are chances that we need to take, really. Thank you, Khalid. And on that note about, um, you know, independent media, you can't help but think about online and social media platforms. And I just want to share um, some interesting metrics. So Northwestern University in Qatar did a study earlier this year looking at media use in the Middle East. And they focused on six countries, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Lebanon, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and the UAE. And they asked um, people within the 18 to 24 age group, um, where do you go for your news and information? What sources um, do you use? And 55, oh, I'm sorry, 84%, again, these are um, people within the 18 to 24 age group, 84% cited the as their number one source for news and information. 75% said social media. Now, if you look at another age group, people 45 years old and over, uh, their number one go-to, television, that was 86%, followed by um, radio at 55%. So that, says a lot right there. And Noah, I wanted to get your thoughts on that because your platform is an online one. Right, so one, one of the things that we're seeing with, uh, with you is that there's disconnect with uh, content. Uh, a lot of the youth has 
opinions wanted to express, and we saw that with the explosion of Twitter, mm. you're still limited to 140 characters. What we it's learned from our, from our uh, readers and some of our writers is that there is a factor of intimidation when it comes to writing. I'm an average person. I'm not educated in journalism. I don't have a writing background. I have my own opinions and my own perspective. But if I do write longer firm form, then I am attacked by all these Arab, Arab elitists. Uh, you're not, you know, your writing is poor. As opposed to debating my opinion and my perspective, you're debating the grammatical errors that I made in my content. What we set out to do is, because content is consumed on social media, we are trying to write in a new form. We are trying to prove to Arab youth that you can express yourself with a simpler form of Arabic that will not be attacked by the elitists. And we spread all of that through social media. Uh, what we're seeing now at the customer is we have a, a huge influx of people that are writing to us to say, we would also like to contribute content on your website. We see the type of content you write. We can write the same way as you do. Right? It's simple. I'm not, uh, I don't need to, uh, a degree to write. And uh, we're starting to see people from across the, uh, the Middle East. We talk about pan-Arab, uniting pan-Arab uh, population. We see people from across the Middle East contributing, sending content. Uh, one of the examples I'd like to use is I'm, I'm Sabi. One of my uh, co-workers is Algerian. We talk about pan-Arab identity, and we're very proud of being Arabs. But I have no, no, um, no, no, no knowledge of how my colleague, my co-worker, lived past 20 years, 30 years of their life. We talk about an identity from a philosophical perspective, but when it comes down to understanding each other, we're missing that. We understand the political events that happen across the borders, but we don't understand how we live. In, uh, part, uh, I think part of the problem here is uh, we don't have Arabic journalism uh, schools. I mean, NYU opened a branch in uh, uh, the UAE. I think there might be one in Qatar. I went to uh, Lebanese University. But I can tell you, my degree is more uh, like political science. Uh, so when it comes to writing Arabic, uh, we do uh, have a problem uh, in that sense. And the training you get as a journalist, they throw you in the field. I mean, so that's, that's, so that's, that's what we started to do is we started training people. We offer training to anybody who wants to write. We have doctors who are leaving their jobs to write for us to become to join our writing staff. Um, we teach them a new form of writing. We don't teach the traditional journalism. We don't teach the Salah and have a Muslim. We teach a much much more simple, much more friendly style of writing. Uh, and we see a lot of appetite for that. And yes, I agree. There should be a lot of institutes. There should be a lot of uh, vocational institutes that teach new media writing. Can I just, two points. One, if I may very quickly circle back to the issue of funding. I think we're all saying exactly the same thing. The devil is in the detail of what we're saying. I think you can get funding from a government and it can completely mess you up in terms of your independence. You can get money from a government but if the right mechanisms are in place, it could empower you to do the kind of journalism that you know we all would like to uh, be in a, a position to, to do. That's number one. I mean, I worked for BBC uh, in London for many years, and you know the, 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 the level of independence, uh, not, not from the government, from the state, Today you can have Labour, tomorrow you can have the Conservatives. But the level of independence from state is obviously great. But there are, there were constraints, uh, there were lines, there were red lines, not Obama's red lines, but there, there, were, there were lines which you could not transgress. And some of those lines were actually written, some of them are basically just fell. So that's number one. The issue of social media in the Arab world, people often ask me, how do you feel about the future of television? And I say, it depends where. Because the future of television in the United States, there are all sorts of questions hanging over the future of television in, in the United States. The future of, from my experience, the future of television in the Arab region 
they're a little bit still more secure, or at least they look a little bit more secure. I have one fundamental reason why I'm saying that, and that is literacy and illiteracy. Because, you know, if, if, you, if you, let me sound a little pompous, if, if King Lear were with us today instead of a horse, my kingdom for a horse, he would have said a laptop kingdom for a laptop. In the Arab region, as we all know, the level of illiteracy is still so high that visual culture still reigns supreme. My grandmother wants to sit and look at television, look at the screen. She may not understand the kind of Arabic that you and I speak, uh, that we have learned in school, but she gets the visual language. Sorry to interrupt you, but to that point, do you think that's one of the main reasons why there's so much recreational type programming on Arab television channels? One like of the Arab reasons. Idol and one of the Netflix. reasons. Yeah, one, one, one of the reasons. The other reason is that there's just a category of people who just want to be entertained. They see the primary function of television is to entertain them. You know, so the issue of Al Jazeera al Arabi, like in, in the Arab world, and I don't wanna I don't wanna digress too much away from social media. I'll come back to it. But just tangentially, if I may say this, a lot of people say, okay, um, Al Jazeera and Al Arabi, they, they are each other's competitors. And I say yes and no. Because I say no because Al Jazeera's audience, if you look at Al Jazeera it comes to Al Jazeera because it wants a particular type of coverage. It wants the coverage of the war in Gaza, what's going on in Egypt, and so on. To that extent, Al Arabiya cannot compete with it. But neither can Al Jazeera compete with Al Arabiya over a type of audience which Al Arabiya has secured solidly. And that is the Arab audience that wants infotainment more than uh, 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 political political news, but these guys. I'm from Morocco. These guys from Lebanon and the Egyptians. You know, they have a, a long tradition of entertainment, televised entertainment. They're very good at it, and they offer it to Pan Arab uh, audiences who have got the virus of you know television as entertainment from American television, and the Americans, they do it so well, it is entertaining. If that's what you're looking for, you go to it. So, and I'm going to get to you, Joyce, in just a second, but, you know, talking about pan-Arab, pan-Arabism, do you think that that type of programming could be leveraged to actually bring people together in some way? I mean, I have no problem at all with people watching entertainment. It's, people need a break. I mean, even here in the U.S., CNN, mostly you know, turn on the TV, and I would put a bet that it would be about Donald Trump or Ben Carson. <laughs> in my newspaper, uh, we're covering Donald Trump a lot. So it's, uh, I don't think this is where, can you hear me? Uh, so in many ways, I do think over here we are a minority. I mean, no offense, but not everyone wants 24-7 uh, news cycle. Uh, so in that sense, yes, people will always be more driven to NBC, to other entertainment channels. They will read my uh, newspaper, Al Hayat, but uh, you know, our youth and our crosswords uh, and some of our columnists, because they uh, base their columns on entertainment, are more uh, read. I think we all have to adjust to this uh, new trend instead of trying to actually, you know, shove the content of uh, ISIS and Daesh and Nusra and uh, everyone else to people's uh, televisions. So do you think that this type of programming, though, the recreational programming, <laughs> could be used? I, let's talk about this. I mean, we're looking for ways, we're talking a lot about how Arab media in all of its platforms can, you know, pushes people apart, right? But let's talk about ways that it could possibly connect them, <laughs> right? It may be hard, but, you know, this is, you know, talking about solutions. 
I think Khaled really wants to say so, something. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I thought I was being sexy. I'm like, all right. <laughs> 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 I'm just a, um, Yeah, regarding, regarding the, the, you know, the, the garments or, you know, the, 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 the sites that, or news that brings people together or programs that brings people together, so they can. Right? How how do you expect to make programs that want to bring people together when the government don't want to make people get together? It's not it's not it's not in there. It's not in there. They, they, they don't they don't want this to get together. They'll never make you make anything that says we are the same. It's never gonna happen. If, it, if it, it's gonna be like a self subliminal message saying that you know we're better than them. Or you know they're they're too far, they're not, or whatever. It's always going to be like that. So we, we need we need we need independent media to do to bring people here. We need free voices, and and, and, and this is a problem. The problem is not the program. The problem is how how we're making these programs. Who's funding these programs? Who, who's, who's telling us what to say? This is the problem. So, Khaled, do you think that the social media and emerging media platforms is the answer? For now, I guess, yeah, like, it, you know, it's, it's I, as I said, this is not only our problem. I mean, I, you know, Fox News or CNN or whatever, it's, it's all, it's all, like, it's, it's the same problem everywhere. You know, it's, it's only telling, telling, telling people that the other side is, 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 is you know, is, is a danger. The, you know, don't, don't cross that line. It's ignorance, you know, it's ignorance, it's ignorance that they're feeding. It's fear that they're feeding, you know? And the, the, the Arab titles are doing the same thing. They're not. They're not much different at all. They're they're also making a sphere, you know, uh, beyond uh, and then the Shia, you know, like the Shia, and everybody's gonna turn Shia. Everybody's gonna, you know, it's it's this it's this constant message, you know. And, and we're, you're never gonna expect them to, to, to change. You're, you're not. You're not gonna change your message unless they change. Does anyone? I want to speak to that. I, 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 I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I would, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure that our job is to go back to Abdurrahim's point to uh, devise a content that would change uh, people. I mean, they want to watch uh, Arab Idol, great. You know, they want to watch. Uh, ISIS video, not that great, but it's out there. We cannot uh, censor it. So it's, you know, democratize the field. Uh, and then just let them choose. But, you know, I also think there's a lack of understanding of our, 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 our culture, our, the Arab world. We talk about politics, political content, and then we talk about entertainment or even trash entertainment. Some of the content that we cover is neither here nor there. We talk about you know, one of our articles that was in, we had half a million people engaged with was how to peel a uh, pomegranate, right? something that everybody does in their lives, but nobody is talking about it. You look at English-based media, you have life hacks, you have personal finance, you have all kinds of topics that are being covered. Nice. Nobody's yeah. taking the, the time or interest in doing that. Right? TV channels are interested in entertainment, but they could do a lot more than entertainment. Right? So is it their mandate? Not necessarily their mandate, but they can. But that, I mean, that, that's why I was talking about business models, because your business model dictates where you go. Sure. You, you put your, your hand where your mouth is. I mean, if, if you just look at, talk about CNN, if you look at what CNN has done recently, a lot, I know a lot of Arabs here in the United States, they look at CNN and they are aghast at how badly they think uh, CNN has changed. And I say, wait a minute, why? And they say, well, they don't do this anymore. And I say, they do what they feel, they go where they feel the audience is. And the same thing for the Arab media. You'll get a lot of psychobabble. You, you cannot outlaw psychobabble because there is an audience that wants that psychobabble. So it depends on the mechanisms. And just finally, you know, for me, I'm an Arab from Morocco, right? I go to the Gulf. I don't need anybody to tell me in what ways I'm Arab and, and what I have in common with the Arabs in, in the Gulf, the furthest away uh, from me geographically. I go and I instinctively feel that, hey, me 
and these guys thousands of miles away from me, we have a lot of things in, in, in common. They don't need me to actually uh, do a program on television or in social media or whatever to say to Arabs, okay, the, you, yeah, you guys, you need to unite and to unite, the, these are the ABCs of, of, of Arab unity. There are some things that come naturally to us and, it, it, and we are prisoners of our political situ uh, 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 situations. That's where the division begins. Okay, thank you. So now we're going to uh, open up the floor uh, to Q&A um, with all of you. So there are, Marissa has the microphone. I do have a microphone, and I do want to ask the first question. <laughs> um, yes, I, mean, I, I might as well kick it off. So um, the Arab world is a very diverse place. There are various ethnicities, various ethnic groups, uh, different religions. Um, how does how do different Arab media platforms um, reflect on this diversity? Because sometimes I feel that it's just one tone, it's just one color. So it is a challenge. Maybe it's not necessarily your role to do that, but there are many stories that are untold. So how do you do that? Would like to uh, take? I sh sure. Can we have three questions at a time, oh. and then we sure. Can I get stories. my pen? Uh, hello. Um, my question is around uh, basically on the challenge which you said of the, the role of um, media in general and social media in particular. You said that in many, many, in many ways that's not our business, so that's not our place to to say what people should do, what they should think. I think. We're not asking that from the media, but we are at least asking for something that is unbiased, and that maybe tell us a story that somehow comes to balance what we get from governments, what we get from religious organizations. I think, uh, it, I don't know whether it's, a, it's in the western part of the world, but at least there is uh, a role from the, for, for the media that, is, that goes well beyond just the business. We're talking about like the fourth power, and I didn't, I didn't see that much in, in, in whatever you said. I, I think media, because of the rich, because of what it's supposed to do in society, has much more uh, to do than just spread information. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, my question kind of relates to this question. Um, I think it's impossible to be biased. And if anyone could be biased, please let me know how to do it. Unbiased, sorry. Unbiased, yeah, yeah, right? Um, my, question, <laughs> my question for you uh, is, all of you is, how, I think the media has so much power, especially news media, so much power, and it is a business, and it's a good business, so why not use this power? You have, you could intervene, especially, I'm sure most of you, you're all Arab, and, so if you identify as Arab, why not work and intervene in these cases? You mentioned pan-Arabism, and I'm so happy you did because we don't talk about it. Your job isn't to let us know I'm Arab, so how am I going to not reunite with a Moroccan or Egyptian? I'm from Syria. No one knows. If we knew how, we would have done it, and we're not. So I think the qu my question is, is that how do you influence us? You know, we're building bridges and breaking and burning them, breaking them. But where are you building these bridges on, is my question, is, you know, where, what's the definition of Arab today? It's so different. My mom says, we created a map. Okay, but now what are we doing now? And we're not just doing war. Sadly, that's what the media is showing, but we're doing so much more. So what does it mean to be Arab? And in your work, how do you redefine that, and how's that foundation? Uh, I'll, I'll just take a shot at... Uh because I think the question was uh, regarding what I said. I did not mean that we cannot influence uh, our readership, our audiences as, uh, you know, print or TV media. Uh, my remark was more, we are not here to tell people if they want to watch entertainment or if they want to watch, uh, uh, you know, Christina Aguilera scream her lungs out till, you know, 2 a.m. 
so this is not really our role. And uh, I think Marissa raises a very good point, which loops in with the question on pan-Arabism. This could be just my opinion, but it's also not our role to tell people how they identify. Uh, I wish that we had in the Arab media something similar to uh, the New York Times, uh, you know, room for debate. Uh, that we have uh, people of multiple ethnicities bring their voice, uh, you know, Kurdish, uh, uh, others. I mean, th th that's what we need, inter-dialogue among Arab, among peoples of the Arab world. I think that's a much more... Uh, unbiased way to go about it, and that's what I hope we as journalists uh, aspire for. I mean, on the issue of uh, Arabness, and I want to I, I speak here just as a human being, not as a journalist. Sometimes the two are mutually exclusive, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I, I grew up in uh, Morocco uh, in the age before satellite television, and let me, it's such a tricky issue. Let me, let me just put it this way. At the time, when I was still growing up in Morocco, if you told me, what do you know about Egyptians? Most of the information that I knew uh, about Egyptians came to me from Egyptian cinema, which I consumed a lot of, like, you know, a lot of other people in, in the region. And then satellite television came, and satellite television started to do the business of journalism differently. It started to penetrate people's homes. It started to bring us individual stories of individual people in Egypt, in Morocco, in Syria, Saudi, what have you. And then that's the moment when you begin to say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. You, you're like a different image of the Arab emerges and a different way of identifying to another Arab uh, emerges if you put aside the issue of Israel-Palestine because we were all brought up you know with the issue of Israel-Palestine and with the Israel-Palestine was the prism through which we politically saw Arabness. Egyptian cinema to me was the cultural prism through which I saw Egyptians. That's all changed now. Now I know how ordinary Egyptians uh, in Cairo and various parts of other Egyptians live, what struggles uh, they have to grapple with uh, to, you know, earn their daily bread. I see the commonalities, I see the differences, but there's one running thread. Somehow I feel that they and I do share certain things called uh, uh, Arabness. They may listen to me blabbering my Moroccan Arabic, they may not understand it, but to me it doesn't matter. Even if they didn't understand what I'm saying, there is something that links me. How do you package that for television? The best way, like I keep going back to, to the point that both uh, uh, Joyce and myself uh, agree on, it is not my role as a journalist to provide the ABCs of Arab unity, but it is my job to bring to viewers throughout the Arab world what, how Arabs live their lives. Uh, not the, the, the kings and the presidents, but ordinary people, so that I can make a decision. This is what I have in common with them. This is where I'm different from them. Now, I have a question, actually. To that point, and to this young lady's question, that's how you see yourself as a journalist, or maybe how Joyce or you know, your colleagues in the region see themselves. But going back to your perception, you view yourself in that way. How do members of your audience view you? If you're going to go back to you know, vocational training for journalism and news, I mean, I was born and raised in the United States. I went to one of the best journalism schools in the country. And, you know, what I was taught and the program and the skills um, is different than, you know, the programs that exist in, in the region. I mean, you said it, Joyce, you have a degree in journalism. 
Um, you went to school in Lebanon, I assume, and you said it was very much more like a political science program. So I think there is a different interpretation of journalism and the role of a reporter and the role of news in the region than there is in other countries, in other parts of the world. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree, members of the audience. Well, I mean, we we agree that there are different uh, different roles, but it's it's a tough one because we, you know, most of us are over caffeinated, overworked uh, journalists who are just looking for news, and you you also have to keep in mind that most of the news today comes from uh, Western uh, news agencies, which uh, controls. A lot of the days, what the content is, and that's based on Western audiences. We don't have the resources. I'm the only one in uh, Washington, you know. So, so, so it's not up. Well, we, we would try. I would love to be, you know, controlling the content or doing other things. But it's not just uh, when you think of a journalist, think of someone who is very overworked and who just runs around Washington all day. And it's much worse with the Obama administration when they send you an off the record talking point uh, saying, oh, Saudi and the United States are great allies, but you can't use it. Or when they tell you that, oh, uh, we are not sure if the meeting happened and you are watching on Al Arabiya, a Saudi prince, uh, speaking after the meeting. So, you know, I, I don't want to like, ask for sympathy, but we, we, we do have our own uh, struggles. Let's take a question. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Medjid, I'm from Syria. My question is, where do you draw the line between being neutral and being passive? Now, it's one thing to be professional and show the facts and show what the people want. Sir, can be Arab idol, one follow up with ISIS, but it's a different thing to waste resources by uh, not using this really, really precious opportunity to actually direct somehow the, the viewers by focusing on the positives versus on focusing on what people, what people want. So where do you draw the line between being neutral versus being passive? Gentlemen in the yellow sweater. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Mansour Badran. I'm a digital cinema student with concentration in uh, cinema production in Nepal University in Chicago. Just have, uh, I think it's, a, it's one question. So, uh, with in 2009, the, uh, with the introduction of like iPads and, and, and you know, uh, technology devices. Uh, we witnessed the death of many actual newspapers in the United States, and the uh, numbers of newspapers in the United States overall started to decline. Up, 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 up. And with the only big corporations like NY Times, LA Times, etc., only survived. Many of them were able to kind of utilize technology to to uh, reach to people and were successful. How can we? use the same approach to, for example, Aldea or for any other, or Jazeera maybe. Jazeera is kind of already done something like that, but how can we witness that with Hayat, how can we witness that with other uh, platforms? Is, can we say that uh, traditional journalism is still a thing in the Middle East or not? Thank you. Let's take one more question and then we can answer all of them. In oh, you, you choose. I don't want to be. Um, oh, this gentleman here in the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Thank you for all the speakers. That was very enriching and wonderful. Uh, my name is Abdel Karim. I'm a multimedia guy, but at least my profession has uh, four different similarities with you. I am a medical guy, so we have the MEDI and similarity. And not only that, but I am also a pediatrician and uh, teaching the adolescent medicine. And some of you, I think, guys mentioned the percentage of the adolescents or young people in our, our, our world, I, I cannot recall since about 50. But this, uh, by statistics, at least in Saudi Arabia, recently we have just finished the survey, 
they produced about 60 persons. And just in order to avoid the debate, according to the definition of World Health Health Organization, the definition means between 10 to 24 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, to put that definition is important so that what we know is 56 years or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Before the session started, I had a few words with Nawab. I asked him, what did you write? He said, everything except regional politics. Um, I like what Khalid mentioned there about the freedom and the honesty. And this will bring me to the question which I wanted to ask. You are discussing the impact of politics on uh, the, the media on building the bridges. I want to ask what is the impact of the finance power and the political agenda and the personal interest on the media. This is number one. Number two, and this is probably mainly for Al Jazeera, what do you think about the impact of our Arabic media on the psychology of our young people? Uh, if I am allowed and I, I uh, hope I will not be offensive, that thing, al Mu'akis, although I respect the, the, uh, the presenter very much, he is knowledgeable and well educated, but as a physician and as a psychologist, I have a very bad impact from that program on our young people. Now there is no more no respect for any professor or any doctor or any sheikh or any da'wah or any whatever. Why? Because we just see them like you, the seen that everybody is attacking the other and sometimes even killing each other. <laughs> so before at my day, I used to speak very much whenever I get a doctor or professor or normal sheikh. Now it is not that anymore. No respect for that. So uh, even if you want Joyce to, uh, to put to control the content in your al hayat but I think will not, you will not be able to. And this is because of the impact of the finance and that. You finally, you are a human, you are looking after your family, you want to... to uh, We're just running out of time, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, Thank you. So, the, the two questions is the impact of the other things on the media, and then the impact of the media on the psychology. Look, I mean, the, the, the role of news Uh, I'll just answer very quickly because it's a very important question. Neutral versus passive. Um, uh, to me, passive is not to cover the story because either your outlet for reasons of ownership or editorial line uh, won't accept it. As a journalist, I will always uh, send it. And it's up to them, my editors or you know others, what, what they do with it. Uh, neutrality is very important and I think we have a big problem in, in the Arab media in the language uh, we use. Martyrs, uh, resistance, uh, uh, words, terrorists, not terrorists. It's not up to us. Uh, I don't use the word martyr in my uh, reporting. Uh, for example, uh, terrorist, I will always add according to this government. Uh, so. This, this is where we can try as much as possible to be neutral, I think, through uh, the language. I agree on the issue of uh, passive uh, journalism. I, I don't think you could probably be talking about neutral uh, and activist journalism. There is something called activist journalism. Uh, there is a theory now 
being circulated, and we use it a lot at Al Jazeera, which is that journalism is with humankind. And all sorts of consequences flow out of uh, that, that definition of uh, activist journalism. Um, just very quickly, the, the, I think when you say human being and neutral, they're almost mutually exclusive. In one way or another, we bring our biases and our backgrounds to the story. You know, you could be so well considered and step back uh, from every word that you say, but words are not innocent. Uh, words have, I think it was Homer who said that words have wings. You don't always have 100% uh, control over how words are received by the other side. We don't have time, so I just want to talk a little bit about the Tijal Ma'akis. Um, <laughs> Because the Tijan Ma'akis raises a, a, a larger and more profound issue uh, in uh, the Arab media. Because, um, does everybody know what the Tijan Ma'akis? I'll just very quickly explain it. The Ma'akis, you take Crossfire from CNN when it was really feisty, uh, feisty mix it a little bit with Jerry Springer when Jerry Springer was <laughs> And you begin to, you know, get the, the, the idea of what Mr. Jan Marcus is all about. Jan Marcus brings two people who are at opposite ends of the political spectrum, or political, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum on any given issue, and you let them thrash it out. Uh, um, and sometimes they thrash it out with words, sometimes they thrash it out with fists. Now, you could have all sorts of negative uh, uh, feelings about the Tijar Marcus. And the view that you have expressed, I hear it all the time, not just here from Arabs in America, but from many Arabs in the Arab world. Irony of the situation, well, before I say the irony, you have to remember that when the Tijar Marcus first came into being, it was a novelty in Arab uh, uh, broadcasting. People in the Arab world at the time, 1996, were not used to people actually speaking frankly to each other. They were not very used in many parts of the Arab world to one uh, side representing the government, another side representing the opposition. In the Libyans, for example, under Qaddafi, many Libyans heard of the Libyan opposition. They've never seen the face of that opposition until the Tijar Marcus uh, came along. Regardless of your feelings about it, and as I said, I, I hear you view very often. Fact is, when you look at the figures, the audience figures that uh, in studying surveys conducted by Al Jazeera, of all the amazing, wonderful programs that Al Jazeera uh, has, the Tijar Mu'akis ranks the highest always. Which means what? Which means that the problem is not is is not in the Tijar Mu'akis. The problem is in the appetite that there is for the show among our viewers. Now we do that. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Abdelrahim, Joy, Sokha, and Alain. I mentioned you, Khalid. Yeah. 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 He wants to say something? I don't know if you want to say something. Um, I was just talking about the people who can see what you have two seconds. I just want to say that it's, it's um, you know, if you're talking about this, the psychological effects, I don't think it's really effects. I think it's just a reflection of, of our reality. This is, this is what, this is what we are. You know? And the thing is, I think why they, they find it,
to say what you have to say. That's it. You know? And, 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 and it's the frustration of, 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 of just being censored, being silenced all, all the time. It's, 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 it's terrible. You know? Um, it, it's, it's, um, I, I don't know how to say it. I, I express it. Because I, every day I go to our school because I have, I have nowhere else. All I have is social media. Every day. I'm, I'm based on social media. Every day I go to our school and I put it out there. You know, because I, I have to let it out. So, so I, I really I understand where where these people that go to to and and fight on the uh, Jack Marcus do that because you, you just, this is your only chance. You know, you have no no other way. I'll probably fight if I go there. 